Thank you very much. And I'll, maybe we should take a minute to thank the organizers for putting together another lovely workshop. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I decided today that I'm going to start instead of with a, a winding narrative, I'm just going to start by giving you the mathematics, just the definitions and, and the, the construction so that I make sure that I get uh, to the stuff that I want to say. So at the very end of the last lecture, I sort of eked in this definition, um, a multi-scale line. It's, it's, a, well, it's a curve, a nodal gene to zero curve with a mark point infinity. Um, in addition, there's a, a total pre-order on the dual graph of the curve. And that just basically means that, you know, there's a, every every vertex of the dual graph is assigned a level. Um, you might as well call them zero to L. And then satisfy some conditions. So the conditions, it's it's sort of easier to draw. Um, so the conditions is basically the dual graph looks like this. So there's a level function. Marked points as usual are gonna I'll, I'll represent with half edges. And then you have some, there's some highest, ver uh, highest vertex v naught, and then you have, uh, you know, it's, you can have some branching, and then eventually, so the rules are basically, here I've, I've, I've shown a level, this would be level zero, level one, level two, let's see, and level three, so this, this thing has four levels, this, the, and so the, it, the data of the, the the fact that these two internal um, vertices are at different levels is part of the data. Uh, every vertex has to have a unique ascending edge from it, and also all of the the minimal vertices all have to be on level at level zero. Um, but and there's a sort of a mild stability condition. So the internal vertices have to have have to be at least trivalent. I mean, you can have a higher valency if you want, but of course the term the minimal vertices are, you know, have to be just univalent. So uh, it doesn't apply to them, but the internal ones are trivalent. So this is the main geometric object. And in addition to that, uh, uh, in addition to this, you have this, this, uh, holomorphic, this holomorphic uh, differential form on each component of the curve, which is really just a P1. And what that does is it just, just turns each of these components into something that's isomorphic up uh, to C up to translation. And so another way to say, think about, let me just for fun draw another. So at each of these uh, internal nodes, you have a bunch of uh, edges descending from it. And you can think what's going on there, there's a sort of configuration of points in C. So here there would be three points. Because after all, that component itself, if you remove the point at infinity, that component is just isomorphic to C. Now, this configuration is only is defined up to scaling. Um, uh, but yeah. Um, and so there's this, there's a, a notion of, of isomorphism here that's relevant. So you don't basically a, a, an R, a projective isomorphism, it's a it's an isomorphism for the curve, but you have uh, the pullback of omega uh, f of v for any for any vertex you know, for all v in v of sigma, and this I, this is my notation for the the vertices of the dual graph. So it's just a set of components of the curve. Um, uh, f of star of omega v v is equal to c v times omega v. <laughs> Um, and uh, well, for CV is in is in either R uh, or it's C or R. So there's a there's a, a so it's either in C times or R times greater than zero. Um, and the so you're basically what this is saying is that oh yeah and the the conditions are. You're allowed to rescale the, the the forms at every vertex, but you have to use the same scaling factor for every vertex in the same level. 
So CU is equal to CV uh, if, if U is equivalent to V. And this, this equivalence relation, I, I mean, has is at the same level. Um, and also uh, CV, CV equals one on the minimal level. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, the, this is what these what these this configuration of points will be in practice. It's the they're they're taking the it, it's very so it's very much analogous to the structure that you were drawing. The the configuration of points that you get if the log of the central charges are going like you know uh, you know alpha one t plus alpha two. I don't know, whatever, t to the one half plus da da da, and then uh, plus some constant beta. So you have some 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 polynomial. I think logarithms. The log of central charge, yeah. So the 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 in the in the story that I was telling before, log of the central charge uh, of some object will sort of be like this, and maybe a different with different fractional you know powers of t if if you're not in the exponential type situation, and the configuration of points you get will at the top level I'll say, okay, you have all these semi-stable objects and you so you get some alphas at the top level. And then at the next level, if you have if you have two objects that have the same first order as leading order asymptotics, and then you have some alphas at the next level, et cetera, et cetera. So the yeah, so so um yeah, and that's what the configurations are are recording. And it's saying that uh well it's just I mean I T or log T, I mean. Oh, you mean some other trailing term? Yes, there are lower order terms. Yes, that does happen in the actual thing. But um, yes, right. But this this sort of framework is can in, 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 in encompass all of that. But it, there is, I yeah, there, it does get a little bit more subtle when you have these log the log terms. Um, okay, so. So there are the objects, and I, I, that's why I find you know from Maxim's talks very interesting. And there's clearly some relationship between uh, these these structures that I end up studying um, to understand these these boundary points um, and this kind of non-Archimedean uh, uh, story that he was telling. So um, we'll see how that what, what comes of that. But um, so this data uh, uh, associated a multi-scale line. Has the following, so it, it's a little bit of a, to, it's a, a little bit to take in. But the point is that um, you have all these different vertices, and you have a partial order uh, on the set of vertices associated to any. Oh, yeah, if you associate to any um, uh, unit norm complex number and any. Uh, oops. Uh, and any t from zero to infinity, you have a partial order, um, and basically it's it, it's only two uh, two vertices in the dual graph are comparable as long as one does not lie below the other. I use this containment symbol for saying that v, w contained in v is when w lies below uh, uh, v. In, in other words, it's it's a descendant of v in this in this tree. Um, and so as long as neither is a descendant of the other in this tree, then what you can do is you have this, this normalized, this uh, PUV, you basically go, if you have two components, you just go up the tree until the, the, the minimal component where they meet. And now you have two mark points and you just take the difference in the coordinate there. Of course, you know, the, 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 the points in C are not well-defined, but their difference is well-defined. That's kind of the point. I mean, technically it's a, it's a, it's a period, it's an integral of, of this one form from the point where one piece of the curve attaches to the point where the other. And then you can say that you define this partial order by saying, okay, well, if they're equal, they're equal. And then one is strictly less than the other. If when I, I take this uh, uh, um, P and I, I guess I can twist it by Zeta, that's what that parameter is, is, is saying, it should lie in a particular cone. And so as t gets larger all the way up to infinity, this cone will narrow. And at t, at t equals infinity, it's a little bit degenerate. At t equals infinity, I want it to be literally just right along the real axis. 
So t is infinity along the real axis. And otherwise, at any finite t, it's allowed to be in a cone. And then t equals zero, it's the open half space. OK, so I have these partial orders. <clears throat> and so, uh, yes, what did I want to say? So I left these blue things for me to, for me to uh, tell you about stuff, but I can't remember what I was supposed to tell you. Can we do a simple example? Yeah, so uh, anyway, so uh, so yeah, so the, the, the simple example is, oh yeah, I remember. So you might have a, a configuration. The simplest example of a, of a multi-scale curve that's non-trivial, uh, a multi-scale line is just when you have a, the, the dual graph looks like this. So gamma is this thing. This is sort of analogous. This is like the exponential type situation. So here you have a bunch of copies of, of, of C basically, but then you have this additional data, which is a configuration of points in C. How the, you, so you, you have this additional data in here, the data is a configuration of points in C. And the, um, so the, the, which is so the, I can take the less than or equal to um, uh, one comma infinity ordering. So basically in this ordering is nothing is comparable unless this is a very sort of uh, strict partial ordering. Nothing's comparable unless you have one, one point that's literally a real displacement from the other. So the, again, again, if you keep in mind what this is supposed to mean, these alphas are recording the rate of growth. And so this is saying that the this is saying that these these two alphas, you know, the imaginary parts are comp growing comparably, but one of the, one of them, the real part, is getting smaller. So this is when you have a central charge of one object that's getting much much smaller compared to the other object, but their phases aren't really going in one direction or another necessarily. Um, and this is like a sort of bad situation for for the it was a difficult situation to handle for this thing. And then the 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 um, unless you know alpha i minus alpha j is an, is a real number. And then the other one that comes up a lot i comma zero. So here I just switch, and here the partial ordering is basically. Okay. What just happened? Oh, okay, it's back. And here, the, what the partial order does is um, you, you just draw these lines. You can sort of draw the lines like this, and the, the, the points are ordered based on which, you know, if one is to the left of the other, to the right of the order, that's the ordering. And you can see that sometimes they're incomparable if they lie on the same vertical line. And again, this seems as the, the different, all the differential equation people here will see this is a very much looks like a kind of a Stokes structure because you sort of have these, you know, these points. You're gonna you you have some angle, some angle zeta that you're rotating, and you're you're looking at the different ordering of these vertices as you rotate that zeta. So it has the flavor of the thing kind of things that comes up, which is good because I'm claiming that you should have a limit point produced by a differential equation anyway. So it's it's good that this thing kind of looks like the data of a differential equation. Okay, so the main, so that's the multi-scale domain. The main homological uh, object is what I call a multi-scale decomposition. And so this is a generalization of a semi-orthogonal decomposition. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's indexed part of the data. There's some continuous data, which is this multi-scale one. Um, and then uh, for every vertex in the dual graph, for every sort of minimal vertex in the dual graph, you have some subcategory. They can, there can be containment in the other. So basically like in a situation where you have, uh, um, in, a, in a situation where you have two, where you have like a U and a V. So basically if U is less than or equal to one comma infinity of V, 
that's the situation where they have the same imaginary part that implies that C less than or equal to U is actually contained in C less than or equal to B. Um, and that, that follows, this will follow from, actually from the second condition here. So, yeah, and then this other thing is analogous. This condition, the, the last condition here that says that if two, if two vertices uh, are comparable and one has a, it, with, this, with this I ordering, so one has a strictly larger phase, then you have semi-orthogonality, but only you only have semi-orthogonality once you quotient by the things which are very, very small with respect to both of those vertices. And so this is so this is a structure that I was led to. You can almost sort of come to it, but yeah, so so let me let me by formal properties, this is kind of the minimal structure that will have the formal properties that you want. So um, uh, so in the simple example where this I uh, I comma zero order, and that's the one that just sort of looks like that orders the points like this. If this is a total ordering, in other words, if your marked points never lie on the same vertical line, then, uh, then, then, uh, so that, that implies that basically nothing, you never have uh, U less than one infinity V. So this, this whole business gets much simpler. Um, uh, this becomes just a semi-orthogonality without taking a quotient. Uh, and so if I less than or equal to I comma zero is a total ordering, like I've drawn in this picture, then you just get a semi, it's the same as a semi-orthogonal decomposition. So C V1. So these categories in this case, less than or equal to V1, less than or equal to V n are all semi-orthogonal. And they're ordered with respect to this total ordering here. So it's a semi-orthogonal decomposition plus a marking, you know, plus the additional data of sigma. So it's you have some additional continuous data, like it's remembering the alphas, so to speak. Um, but homologically, it, on the categorical level, it's just a semi-orthogonal decomposition. The other extreme is when you have uh, everything is comparable with respect to one common infinity. That's the situation where all the, um, uh, yes, that's the situation. I don't know why, but I've been drawing this incorrectly. It's the ver the the i i comma zero ordering is the uh, is 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 ordering them by imaginary part, not by real part. Sorry. Because you rotate it by. You rotate it by 90 degrees when you, when you divide by I and then you are filtering by real parts. So, okay, so this is the, sorry, this is the I ordering, disregard whatever the picture I drew above. Um, and, but it's basically, the, the, it's the same, the conclusion is the same. You get a similar orthogonal decomposition. The one comma infinity being a total ordering is when they all, all the alphas lie along a single line. And so you have the, uh, so, so, in this case, what the what the axioms amount to is you have C less than or equal to V1 is contained in C less than or equal to V2 is contained in da 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 is contained in C less than or equal to Vn is equal to C. So on the one hand, in one extreme, you just get the categorical information is just a semi-orthogonal decomposition. And in the other hand, the categorical information is just a filtration of the category by fixed subcategories. And so if you, if you want a, 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 an object that allows you to represent just the filtration by thick subcategories and also a semi-orthogonal decomposition, and if you want it to have a recursive kind of nature, you're sort of driven to this uh, uh, definition. So basically what I would like to be able to do is that if I have uh, a, you know, some uh, um, decomposition of this kind, and then I give a further decomposition, of the category of the quotient category. So this, uh, so when you have a decomposition like this, I have the C less than or equal to V categories, but really what I want to think about is every vertex is not being associated with C less than or equal to V category. It's being associated with quotient C less than or equal to V by the stuff that's, that's, that's 
you know, much smaller than B. And so each of these vertices has kind of these a quotient category associated to it. Of course, in the semi-orthogonal situation, it just is the C less than equal V is the category. There's nothing that's less than V. But in this situation, you have these four categories, but you, I, I want to say, if I have further decompositions of these categories, I can sort of glue them in. So I want it to be a recursive kind of structure. So here I have like CV1, CV2, CV3, et cetera. And I want my the notion of the decomposition of the category, the kind of uh, that we're gonna end up studying. So I can like sort of just glue it in. Like I can definitely glue in the multi-scaled line. So this, if I, you know, and, and vice versa, it's actually just equivalent. So if I wanna add multi-scaled lines here, I can glue and I get a new multi-scaled line and a new, I should be able to combine these decompositions of each of these, of each of these vertex categories into a, a, a finer multi-scale decomposition. Yeah, exactly, yes. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. It's exactly like a dimension filtration. I mean, yeah, there's, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's the dimension filtration. So every, every variety will have a sort of large, large volume limit point in the space that I construct, which is the dimension filtration. Um, but, you know, the, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it won't be a manifold of corners. Um, uh, but, yeah. Like if you're Calabi, yeah, those are the only kind of points that you get. Um, okay, so finally we're ready for the definition of a, of of. So we have this this categorical idea of a multi-scale stability uh, multi-scale decomposition, um, which is kind of a, a generalization of an SOD that's indexed by a, a multi-scale line. And uh, and so an augmented stability condition. Is is just a multi-scale decomposition So it's just a multi-scale decomposition. Um, and then remember from the first lecture, we had this idea that a stability condition can just be remembered instead as a map um, uh, from the, the set of objects in the category to the complex numbers. Uh, that satisfies certain axioms that it's not really worth, they're not very natural looking axioms, but it's a kind of a nice way to think about it. So here I'm just saying that uh, for every minimal vertex in this graph, in other words, for every sort of minimal component of this curve, I have a map LV from CV, uh, CV being the quotient category, minus zero to the smooth locus of that, of that actual geometric uh, minimal component. And so this is a very uh, natural way of, of saying, well, this is the same thing. So I want this, this, this map here to define a, a pre-stability condition on the quotient cap, to come from a pre-stability on the quotient, condition on the co quotient category. Um, but you can see that because this, this isomorphism is only up to translation, it's only up to C action, that you can only recover, let's call this, uh, can only recover the stability condition up to, up to the action of J. Or up to the action of C by translation. So, Basically, what the you know these curves don't have additional. The curve has a single mark point p infinity, but then each terminal component has sort of infinitely many mark points. It's marked for every object in the category sort of gives you a mark point on the on the terminal components. Okay. Are there any questions about this? So these are basically these are the objects that we're going to study. I, I've omitted. There's some like little subtlety of the. Uh, uh, if you want to if you want to state the support property for these objects, you have to say you have to be a little bit subtle that the it, you know even if you have a semi-orthogonal decomposition, the churn character map does 
doesn't have those two, the image of the two churn character maps for those two pieces don't have to be independent, linearly independent in the, in the lattice lambda, um, in which case, it, I don't know, if it, that's not what you want. So there's some additional linear algebraic data that you have to state in order for the support property to be formulated correctly. But at this level of detail, it's, it's not really important. There is a support property that I'm omitting. Okay, are there any questions about this? Um, okay, so that those are the objects, that's the set. And now what I wanna tell you about is, this is a space. Um, and so for that, we have to consider not multi-scale lines. They don't have, you know, the multi-scale lines don't have really a moduli space, but if you mark, if you add mark points to all the terminal components, uh, the rule is that every component, every terminal component has to have at least one mark point. Um, that rigidifies things. And, and then you actually do get a projective modular space. So an end mark multi-scale line is just a multi-scale line with an additional mark point. Um, uh, if you have multiple mark points, they can't, they're allowed to overlap. There's no, there's no restriction there, but they have to lie in the smooth locus. And um, with these conditions, you actually uh, have a, a, a proper, Com, uh, you know, a, a compact complex manifold that's a moduli space for these things up to complex projective isomorphism. So again, that doesn't allow any rescaling on the minimal level of the of the uh, of the differential forms. But the full, but on every other level, the form is allowed to be rescaled by an arbitrary non-zero complex number. But there's another variant. So this is actually a, a compact complex manifold. And the inside, so that this is I, maybe has been implicit. I don't know if I, but the actual most generic marked multi-scale curve is this. It just has a single, so I have p infinity, and then I have just a, a single component, p one through p n. So what is this? This is just uh, uh, the single component is isomorphic to. Um, uh, a C is P1 with the differential form DZ. And so this, this data of, of uh, the additional N marked points is just a configurate, is just a, a, a tuple, an N tuple of points in C, and it's defined up to translation because that's the kind of isomorphism that I'm allowed. Uh, so there's, you're not allowed to rescale on it. So, so, so in the inside, the, in, the generic point in here looks like this. It's just endpoints modulo translation. And in fact, the, 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 the boundary, it's an S, has an SMC boundary. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and if you take the, if you take the real oriented blow up of that, that also has a modular interpretation, namely the real oriented blow up are these N marked multi scale lines up to real projective isomorphism. So now, on the forms on every level, you're allowed to rescale by a positive real number, not by a complex number. And that also, so that gives you a manifold with, with corners. And so this topological space is, 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 is a key thing. I don't, yeah, I do, I, I, I'm not gonna go into the details of this construction, but I just wanna remark, um, because I'm an algebraic geometer and this kind of frustrates me that in algebraic geometry, it's very rare that a moduli space is constructed with coordinate charts. Usually you have a, like a, a moduli functor and then it's a, uh, you know, it's a theorem that the moduli functor actually is representable by a moduli space. Uh, mm -hmm. But we, could, we can't find a, a good reasonable moduli functor for this. It, 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 uh, it's just the space is constructed by hand. It, it, you can write down some coordinate functions. You can say, okay, these sets are open and you write down some coordinate functions and you show that they, identify each open set with like C to the N times C star to the M, something like that. And then you glue them and you get this, this uh, um, projective manifold. So I'm not gonna, I'm gonna spare the details. Also, you know, maybe this is like a less uh, interesting thing for people who study moduli spaces more from this uh, geometric perspective anyway. But I would like to say a little bit about um, uh, when you have, about what the what the boundary looks like. So so the strata. So 
when does when does a marked multi-scale line degenerate um, to another marked multi-scale line it, in this in this moduli space? That's if there's a contraction of the dual graphs. So basically, there's a kind of formal definition, but what it really means is that a contraction is just a surjection on vertices that just smooshes together some levels. So for instance, I can draw a picture. What I mean by a contraction. Um, so, you know, I can, I can, this is a, a sort of an interesting one. So let's say you have some, you know, some points or whatever. So this is a, this is a dual tree and these are slightly different levels, but an example would be actually the identity map. Uh, so this is level zero, one, two, three, but the a contraction an example of a contraction would be the identity map. Um, but now where the, the two middle things are on the same level, so. So zero, one, two. So that's an example um, in this picture, this would be an example of a contraction. So you're allowed to, um, and what that means is that uh, uh, this, this one, this is more generic. And then you can further, you know, if you wanted to, you can contract these levels basically, but th that's the, those are the only kinds of degenerations that you have in this modular space when two levels merge. Um, and of course, the most generic is when all of the levels merge and you get back to, you know, the, the, the picture with like, just like this. And I should say that the co-dimension of the strata, so the co-dimension actually is equal to the number of levels. I guess the number of levels minus one. So this is the this is the this is the codimension zero stratum that has just a single level. This one has codimension three, and this one has uh, codimension. Uh, sorry, this one has codimension two, and this one has codimension three. So that's that's the that's the way in which uh, th these boundary points, these strata, connect to each other. Um, and I would should say I I have this this this. Um, you know, a point of frustration for me is that I can't write down a moduli functor that, but maybe it's not surprising that these objects are essentially combinatorial. I mean, they're, you know, the, the, there's a tree and then at each level of the tree, you have a configurate, you have a, a, a configuration of points in C up to, up to, uh, tr to translation. So it, they're essentially a combinatorial gadget. And in fact, um, my student discovered and he's uh, working on the a proof sort of independently that these varieties have been studied before by Junhu and, and collaborators. Um, you know, uh, all, all this business with you know Hodge, Hodge theory for matroids and stuff like that. They 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 have been studying these so-called augmented wonderful varieties, and this is an example of an augmented wonderful variety. So somewhat surprising, um, but maybe that's somehow an explanation. This is really a combinatorial object. So. Finally, now that I, 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 I have the space of n marked multi-scale lines, I can now describe um, uh, the space of augmented stability conditions. So I have to say one thing, which is that given a multi-scale decomposition, I want to give, say what it means for one decomposition to be a coarsening of another. So what does it mean, like, you know, for a, it, it, in the classical case, um, you know, uh, yeah, I can have I could have a decomposition that looks like this, a, a semi-orthogonal decomposition. So this would be like a four. This this picture would give you like a four-term semi-orthogonal decomposition. And what I'd like to do is merge, just forget, and merge these together. And of course, I get a two-term semi-orthogonal decomposition. So I'd like a, a a notion of coarsening, and there is such a notion. The definition is maybe a little bit hard to. Digest, but the but the 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 point is that for any contraction, uh, for any contraction of the of the dual graph, it's possible to define a coarsening, but the coarsening need not exist. So it's it's uniquely determined by the contraction. It's a it's a it's it is a coarser decomposition of the category in some sense, but but it doesn't have to exist. And there's a basically a categorical obstruction. So. Um, 
the coarsening is supposed to always take you from a, a, a more special situation to a more generic situation. So for a two-term multi-scale decomposition, so it, so it has to look like the dual graph has to, um, it has to look like this. And so there's just a single number, basically alpha. Uh, that And so if alpha is just a real number, what this is saying, the, the decomposition, so in this situation, the decomposition just says like, is C1 lives inside C2 is equal to the category C. So this is, this is if alpha is a real number. That's a sort of non-generic situation. Now, if I perturb a little bit up, so if this is this is this is like v1 and v2. If I perturb a little bit up, so this is so I move my alpha up, then now their imaginary parts are different. So the the data is a semi-orthogonal decomposition, and the semi-orthogonal decomposition is c is equal to um, you get c1 and its semi-orthogonal complement, I'll call this like B2, it's the semi-orthogonal complement of C1 on this side. So now this is the this is the semi-orthogonal. So in order for the, you in order for that to be a multi-scale decomposition, you have to have admissibility. You need the C1, the inclusion of the C1 to have a, a left, I guess a left adjoint in this case. And if you were going to go in the other direction, if I want to move like this. I change my configuration of points like this. The, then what, what the what you'll get is a is a semi orthogonal decomposition. Um, C is equal to uh, C one on the right, because now V one has a higher phase. The imaginary part of V one is higher, and so that that means that it's going to be on the right in the semi orthogonal decomposition. Um, and then I'll call this B two prime. So this is a this is a special situation, and I want to say that this decomposition, uh, I can sort of coarsen it. I can sort of you know perturb it slightly, and I get this decomposition, or I perturb it and get that decomposition. And of course, they both perturb. I can collapse this, these two levels, and I just they both perturb to just the 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 generic thing like this, which is just C equals C. There's no decomposition at all. So the trivial, everything sort of coarsens to the, to the trivial decomposition. Um, and so this notion is, is important because I want to say when is, you know, when are, I want to say which augmented stability conditions are close to a given. One. And so in order to say that, I have to say when is a multi-scale condition, multi-scale decomposition close to a given one. And that's what this coarsening thing um, recovers. And as you can see in this example, the B2 is uniquely determined by the original data. Right, it's C one is 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 B two is the orthogonal complement of C one. It has to be, and B two prime has to be the orthogonal complement of C one on the other side. So the the categorical data is actually uniquely determined by the by the you know the change in the in the in the combinatorial data. Um, but it, it only exists if the if you have some admissibility. So okay. So given a multi-scale decomposition, I can define a set and I wanna say these are the, right. So these are the, um, the augmented stability conditions. So it's, a, it's some multi-scale decomposition B indexed by a curve sigma prime and some L, uh, some you know, L functions that are, that are determining the stability conditions on the, on the sub quotients. Um, and I want to just say all such data such that this decomposition is a coarsening of the given one. So it's again, this is the, core, the, 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 the largest dual graph is the lowest strata. And you're saying all ways of coarsening it, of course, you know, are the nearby um, multi scale decompositions. And so now this is enough to define what, what's, what I call the weak topology on this on the set of augmented stability conditions, I declare these sets U to be open. And for any collection of objects, EI in the, in the C less than or equal to VI, for this, for this central 
multi-scale decomposition, I have these functions. Namely, I can, I can, you know, I, I have, uh, oh, at least for t equals zero, it's part of the data. Literally for any collection of objects, I can take the image of that under the L maps and I get some mark points on the curve. And that gives me a map from multi-scale uh, uh, augmented stability conditions to these marked and marked multi-scaled lines. So the, you know, the, the, the image here So you know a a uh, decomposition B along with the this uh, these functions L. It's taken to the multi-scale line, which is now just sigma prime, and then the mark points uh, L of E one, L of E n. And that's that's a that that will be a multi-scale line. So I have, there's a little bit of a, uh, um, a warning, something that I, again, I'm not gonna get into the details, but this doesn't exactly recover, where at least it's not, in general, it does not recover bridgeless topology. Um, uh, but um, in many examples, it seems to. And so it's, 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 it's tempting to speculate that like, if you have a generator or something like that, if you're category with a generator, it recovers bridgeless topology, but I, I'm not sure if that's true in general. Um, and it's definitely not true for, for really big categories, like a direct sum of infinitely many copies of vector spaces. Um, this won't be true, but uh, anywho, the theorem is that this space of augmented stability conditions with either this weak topology just defined in this way above, the, the, the weakest topology such that the U's are open, and these L, L functions are continuous, um, that's a Hausdorff space. Uh, and that this, this open sub, this subset of actual stability conditions is open. Um, and it's true for the strong topology because you just add a slightly, the strong topology is the weak topology plus a slightly stronger condition on nets to be convergent. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is actually was like sort of a tricky theorem because all you the only data you have is you have a bunch of uh, uh, stability conditions and some some sequence or net of stability conditions and you want to recover all of the data. So I want to say just from this this net of stability conditions, I want to say which what what are, where, how are the category decomposing and what are the what are the uh, alphas the configurations of alphas and and uh, you know which objects are semi stable in the quotient category. So there's a sort of lot of data to recover. From just a sequence of stability conditions, but it's actually possible to, to recover it uniquely. That's that's basically what this, this theorem is about. So I have this Hausdorff space um, with this with, I, they, with the strong topology. And the conjecture, the manifold with corners conjecture, is um, if you have n objects that are actually a basis for the charge lattice for lambda, uh, and uh, Every object appears is in one of these vertex categories, C less than or equal to B. Um, then this, these maps, these log central charge maps from this open set on which they're defined to RMN bar uh, is a local homeomorphism. And that's this conjecture is only possibly valid if you have this admiss enough admissibility. So, you know, at, at points, multi scale decompositions where all the inclusions of categories have left and right adjoints. That's what you call an admissible point or admissible multi-scale decomposition. And the conjecture is that for an admissible multi-scale decomposition, this map is a, is, a, is, a, is a local homeomorphism. So this would be analogous to Bridgeland's main theorem. Um, but but I, don't, I don't know how to prove it at the moment. And so, like I, I mentioned the other day, like I, at first I was just worried that's my, this like my inadequacy. Um, this, maybe this is a very easy thing to prove, and I'll state it in some. And that might still be the case, but uh, but we'll see that there's some interesting um, consequence that seems non-trivial. So uh, yeah. So the the let me talk talk a little bit about this thing. So the co as I mentioned, the the co-dimension of a boundary stratum. Uh, uh, the, so if you have a point, the co-dimension co-dimension of a stratum is the number. Of, of levels in the dual graph. So it's a little bit counterintuitive because when I first, um, 
yeah, when I first started messing with this stuff, the, the naive thing would be, okay, well, a divisor, a co-dimension one boundary component should be a two-term semi-orthogonal decomposition. And then they should meet at a three-term, you know, a co-dimension two should be a three-term semi-orthogonal decomposition and so on. Um, but I just couldn't get that to work. Like I couldn't find the right local model that would that would uh, plausibly describe that space. So I ended up with this thing. And it is possible at the end of the day, there is a compactification like that that's just singular. There might be like a sort of highly singular compactification, but this thing is, is sort of supposed to be like a resolution of that. It's like a manifold of corners. Um, uh, um, but what it means is that even a, 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 a five-term semi-orthogonal decomposition is still a boundary divisor. And the only way that two boundary divisors meet is when you have a non-trivial, like a deeper tree. So that's the nature of this compactification. <clears throat> and so I should say that basically with the gluing constructions and sort of known results about stability conditions, you can prove this conjecture in the neighborhood of any point that's really a semi-orthogonal decomposition. So if, 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 if less than or equal to i comma zero is a total ordering, then this conjecture is not very hard. It follows from known constructions about stability conditions. Um, but there you have these hard points is when, so again, I'm showing the simplest case where you, you're, you just have a single non-minimal uh, uh, component um, and then a bunch of stuff below it that's just moving around. So this is, again, this is like the exponential type case. And there are these points where as you're, so you can moving along the boundary basically corresponds to rotating this configuration of points. So that's this sort of degree of freedom along the boundary. It's just rotating this configuration of points. And as you rotate, you'll end up getting mutation. So here I've drawn an example where um, uh, these points are ordered, four has the smallest and three, then one, then two. And so you have a ca category uh, with a semi-orthogonal decomposition in this, in, this, in this order here. But then if I rotate, as I increase theta, if I rotate this configuration, the first thing that will happen Oopsies. Okay. Um, oh yeah. So if I if I rotate this configuration, the first thing that will happen is that these two will cross. Alpha two will cross over alpha one. And so that corresponds to this mutation. So this next sort of piece of the boundary um, uh, will, will have this category C1 crossing over the category C2, and then that is gonna be a mutation. And so as you rotate theta, you'll get like a whole sequence of mutations until you basically wrap around and then you get the Sarah functor, acting by the Sarah functor. So um, I should say one consequence of this manifold of corners conjecture is if it holds, then it, it should be possible to come up with a holomorphic compactification where you basically, you know, you take this, um, you take this thing and then you sort of, you know that locally it looks like the universal cover of a, of a real oriented blow up and you just sort of contract down the boundary components, I think. So I think basically what will happen is that it, you get a holomorphic compactification of the stability manifold modulo the, the Sarah functor. That's my claim. That is that is that if the manifold of corners conjecture holds, you should get a holomorphic compactification of stab mod ser, and, and also I will see. So, but here these are the hard parts because this is a point where the data is just really a filtration, or you know a, a, you, you don't have semi-orthogonality. So you have some stability conditions over here that are glued from the semi-orthogonal decomposition, and some stability conditions here that are glued, but as you cross from one region to another, you have to leave the glued region. And so there are these, there, this, the conjecture is saying that there are enough stability conditions in between that you can get from one to the other. So there, it's basically saying there are lots of unknown stability conditions uh, that you can get, or so, you know, not currently known method of constructing stability conditions from a semi-orthogonal decomposition besides glue. That's what the manifold corners conjecture is saying. Now there's this funny consequence. So it's a very soft argument, but the conjecture above um, uh, about the existence of these stability conditions. So if C is a smooth and proper category and you have any stability condition in C, um, uh, then what this conjecture implies is that for any object X, 
there's a constant such that you have a bound like this, this kind of Hom mass bound, that the, 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 the dimension of the R Homs is bounded above. And this is not the alternating, this is not the Euler characteristic, this is literally just the sum of the dimensions uh, is bounded above by the, by the, roughly by the mass of the object Y. So this is an inequality, it's actually shown up in some of the papers that have done, like I saw it in the paper of Woodmills uh, on dynamical systems and categories and, and uh, Ikeda's uh, paper. So it's shown up a little bit in the context of studying dynamical systems, uh, categorical dynamical systems. Um, but I, I don't think it's been conjectured that this should hold in general, but there's a consequence is that this, this inequality should hold in general for a stability condition on a smooth and proper category. And this is a, a purely categorical thing that can be investigated as a, as a in fact, there's a little bit of evidence that this is equivalent to the manifold with Horner's conjecture. So it's possible that this is the, this inequality is the crux of the matter. So why would this follow from the stability from the manifold with Horner's conjecture? It's kind of a cute argument. So if you have a smooth category, uh, um, uh, a smooth and proper category C in an object, you can form a new one by what's by a gluing construction. Of, I've already mentioned gluing at the stability condition, but you can also blue categories, and you get a bigger category D that has a single exceptional object, um, and, and then a, a factor, a uh, single exceptional object and a factor that looks like C, and the gluing data says that the arhams from, well, it's, it's what I've written here, that the arhams from the exceptional object to any object in C are just the arhams from X to Y in C. And so I can glue, and that will again be a smooth and proper category, and I can find uh, one stability condition, sigma one, such that the uh, uh, such that the object y itself is semi-stable, and then that's in that's for this gluing. But there's another region I can glue in the opposite direction, and I can glue the same two stability conditions there. And now, um, uh, now y will not be semi-stable anymore because it's not going to lie, y lives in C, but not in C prime. So the mutation gives me this exact triangle, and it turns out this will be mass additive for the other stability condition. And so you just kind of take that mass add additivity and it implies that the, the dimensions of the Arhams, because this is mass additive, the, the mass of this first term has to be less than or equal to the mass of the middle piece. And that's what this is saying. And now the point is that what the manifold with corners conjecture says is that sigma one and sigma two lie on the same connected component of the stability manifold. In particular, they're finite distance apart and in Bridgeland's metric. And that's, that actually is just implies that there's a constant like this. So when I say it's a soft argument, really uh, this inequality should follow from if you believe that any anytime you look at these two semi-orthogonal decompositions, and you look at stability condition one and stability condition two, they lie on the same connected component and are therefore finite distance apart. So I think that that's a pretty plausible um, uh, explanation. Otherwise, so if the manifold with corners conjecture fails, these two points, these two glued regions have to be infinitely far apart. But there are all those conjectures that like stability manifolds are often connected and you know stuff like that. So, yeah, okay, it's, it's plausible. But that's the argument. But there's this sort of surprising application of moduli spaces. So, you know, I mentioned that um, uh, I mentioned that algebraic geometers like to think of their moduli spaces as a functor of points. Um, and so there's previous lots of previous work on this question because stability conditions have been used to construct interesting hypercalar varieties and, and to study um, birational geometry of moduli spaces and things like that. So so uh, there's a sort of separate literature on on studying moduli spaces of objects. Uh, of semi-stable objects for a stability condition. And so, uh, so there's this sort of already been written down in moduli functor. If C is smooth and proper, and you have a stability condition, um, then you have this moduli functor, which, which, which sort of classifies families of, of sigma semi-stable objects uh, whose, turn, whose turn character is A uh, in this charge lattice. And, and you have to say the phase should be between zero and one, or else you have some ambiguity. Uh, but um, uh, yes, um, so so the following is like a little theorem. Uh, so the following two things are equivalent. So I have a smooth and proper category, and and every category like that has a generator. And to say 
if, there, there, if there's any function at all, any function of the mass that upper bounds the dimension of the Hongs from the generator to E, uh, if there's any function at all like that, then, uh, um, then these moduli functors admit proper good moduli spaces for all elements in the charge lattice. Um, the key here is the, is the, is the boundedness. So lots of, you know, with work of myself and others, this uh, construction of moduli spaces, and the analysis of algebraic stacks and stuff has been developed quite a bit. So lots of the tools were lying around. The key thing that's not, that's not sort of a general, there's no general method for is to show boundedness of the semi-stable locus. And so this inequality, this Hom mass inequality um, implies that the semi, the, this modular functor is bounded. And it turns out that that's the key thing. Um, uh, yeah, and then lots of the other technology, you can you can build this little argument that 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 says that you can apply all the machinery and you get a proper good modular space. But then it's and then, and then it actually goes back the other way. So this is basically the only mechanism. So, but you know this inequality that I've mentioned um, is saying something a little bit stronger. It's saying that this thing should be linear. This bound is not just any function of the mass, but it's linear. Um, so I think that's, oh yeah, that's the end. So that, so that's the, yeah, so that's the, the interesting application that I sort of discovered as I was journeying towards the ends of the stability manifold. Okay. I'll stop there. Thanks.